this is this is it this is the recording uh so welcome to the lacuna festivals i'm sarah j mason i'm simon turner and tonight we are hosting um worlds of art with rekha samia and channing gray two of our participating artists from this year um rekha shall i hand over to you first Thank you very much. Um, just to sort of give the background, Channing and I don't know each other at all. We've never met. And it is only because of this Lacuna Festival. I was part of it and I was uh, in the first edition. Was it the, was it the first edition or the second? Yeah, yeah uh, you were in the first. first. Yeah, so I traveled to uh, Lanzarote and got introduced to these amazing people and the amazing landscape. And I'm really happy to be uh, part of the second one. And even if it's online, it's nice to be part of something. This and is the third yeah. one now. Oh, third one. Oh, yes, I missed the second. Um, <laughs> but as an online, even if it's online, I feel like it's been, it's a community uh, one establishes every time and new connections. So um, I'm happy to be part of this festival. Over to you, Channing. Yeah, it's a great experience, you know, and being able to see the festival turn into like a virtual platform where before people would like submit to vessels and sometimes they can't make it because the location is either too far away or limitations where beauty of technology, we're able to have contact with people across the world that we've never met, as you said before. So this is a great experience. Thank you for the opportunity. I think it might be the only silver lining from the pandemic is that um, everybody is a little bit more savvy now when it comes to kind of distance working. And I think that for us creatives, that can only mean good things. Yeah, um, so um, Channing and I, we were trying to understand how do two people introduce themselves, you know? I mean, there are certain uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it, keywords associated to both of us. One, we both are artists. And uh, other than that, um, I have no idea uh, what Channing, um, Channing's work is like. So we tried to kind of see, well, how do we want to talk about this? I mean, uh, do we have uh, pre-scripted questions or do we start with whatever just comes to, our, uh, to us at this time? So we just thought we'll just uh, freestyle a bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, just go with that. So uh, Channing, just, just chip in, okay? Otherwise, I just stop with no comma or full stop. I, I, I see that. No, it's good. Uh, a little nervous and whatnot, but um, I can start by asking, what does your art represent, or what do you, what is, what is the message behind your work? What, what do you represent when you make work? Is there something you want to tell? Or is there something where you want to say like a certain thing? So um, I'm, an, I'm a site-specific artist. And for me, I, I feel like I've been forced into a studio these, two pa these past two years because of the pandemic, you see. So in a studio, the environment is controlled. Uh, it's sort of... Uh, some, some artists thrive in this kind of environment where they have their cup of tea at the right temperature, the music is uh, Radio 4 and, you know, they've got everything going and they just get into the zone. For me, my zone is basically um, a new space, new energy and new people. So I'm missing that quite a lot. So a lot of my work has been visiting new places and sort of just becoming that observer, that artist who's an observer, who goes around, observes things. And I come from another place, like I'm going to Lithuania to a very small village next, um, next week. And I have nothing, I don't read up, I don't read TripAdvisor, I don't do Lonely Planet, I just go. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's good. <laughs> so, <then, laughs> so there's no map. And I deliberately get lost and end up talking to people. And 
and the strangest things have happened to me. Uh, lovely things. Of course, you've got to be a bit careful that there is no psycho talking to you or leading you into an alleyway. Other than that, <laughs> I think if you can, <laughs> if you can just sort of go with it, it's like I, in Barcelona, I was a bit lost and I asked this guy, you know, so where do I go to this? Place? So he said, don't worry, I'll walk with you. So I said, okay, it's a public space. It's okay to walk with somebody. From the time I would met him to the, my destination, he gave me his whole life story. <laughs> he told me about his parents divorced and, uh, you know, how he makes time between Spain and Italy and the whole sort of, in, he gave me an insight into his life. I mean, uh, same thing in, uh, in Basel, I was, cross, I was crossing the Danube and I must, crossed, I must have crossed it twice and got lost. Spoke to this woman and she said, I'll take you, I'll walk with you. And by the time we had crossed from one side to the other, she had told me her whole life story. She had told me that she was married to a man who was 20 years older to her, her friend's son and blah, blah, blah. So I have all these stories and sort of, which sort of make the, in the spaces impersonal, but when I talk and exchange these things, or I'm actually a listener. I listen, I observe, I'm like the voyeur. And when these people tell me their stories, these spaces become very personal. So it's, that's the kind of journey sure. and the, yeah. Yeah, so that's the, that's the connection that you have to the places. Being a specific artist, you connect the stories that the people have with those spaces. Yeah? Correct. Yes. That's brilliant. And, uh, I, and I just sort of, again, take photographs of, of places and everything. And then this, these two years in the studio, the way I have survived is go back to these photographs and to that, those journeys and that memories and I create these kind of architectural murals where uh, it's almost like I'm mentally meandering through those spaces again. Uh, and I know the mind remembers things in a weird way. It forgets some things, it remembers some things, but then that's where being an artist comes into play uh, where you select instinctively what you want to put into your work. And together it becomes like a tapestry of memories where you sort of, and the only stitch or the thread which sort of puts it all together is me. But then the challenge of that artwork is how do I open up that uh, experience to my viewer? Mm -hmm. So, um, it's every work is a challenge and for me every work has to have a certain intention certain experience a certain and it's very yeah. complex feeling yeah that's right so uh, so can I return this question to you and we can always ask people who are here to ask us questions in return so um, so how do you, how, what kind of an artist are you? I mean, are you an individual first and then become an artist? Are you, I mean, how does that, how do you work that? I um probably the earliest memory of starting art is drawing on the walls in, in my bedroom. Parents would get mad, of course, but eventually they gave me a piece of uh, a sketchbook, like, here, if you want to draw, I'll draw on this pad of paper. And I'm like, all right. So from then on, I just always was... Channing, I, <laughs> Channing I'm sorry. I, I can't hear you at all. I can't oh. hear you at all. It's all very sort of... Uh, am I muted? I don't think I'm muted. No, you're better? not muted. Um, I think that maybe... Um, it's Rekka's internet because actually I think that Rekka has just dropped out of the meeting. Let me okay. see. Oh no, Rekka's here. Rekka's now muted. You just yeah. unspotlit yourself. Let me put you back up. Here we go. Okay. There you go. Thanks, Sarah. 
That's okay. Is that better? Can you hear everyone again? Yeah. Okay. Do so I Jenny, sound okay? I can project. Yeah, you, this is better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's, um, it's no problem. All right. So I, you know, not really. Not introverted, but whenever I wanted to find myself, I would just draw ideas and everything. And I would always want to create little stories, you know, doing little comics because that was like my first introduction into the art world was reading graphic novels and, and manga, of course. But it turned into appreciating the old masters as well. So going to an art school since high school, all the way through eight years of college, I, I kept looking at these old masters' work, this narrative story that they were telling through religious icons to um, wars or even dreamlike spaces like Hermione's book, Bosch with his like the three uh, panels that he has for that one thing. I uh, forget the name of it, but it's one of the works where it shows heaven, earth, and then hell. And it shows this weird symbolic torment of humans throughout the cycle of life. And I was drawn to that. So I think my work, it's, it's a similar, um, it's a similar feeling where I'm creating a story with these floating figures. Where I wanted to create this duality of the dream state to the cosmic space because I was always, I grew up looking through a telescope with my dad, looking at the stars, and I was drawn to these these stories of um, pictures of these symbolic celestial entities and the stars and how they like oh the story of Hercules. Was a, was a new was a semblance to this other story and like oh we see stories around us and every culture has their own version of what the stars mean to them and you know sailors on the ocean they follow certain stars and go home and I think moving between my parents back and forth I kind of felt like well this is my father's house this is my mom's house I didn't have my place between I had like you know a, a space to live with them and they're both home but when I was younger it kind of felt like I'm being like a package, I kept moving around. So my work grew into this floating, non-specific space. It was always like everything was floating because I felt like I was being moved around back and forth. And I think I started, I didn't realize it until much later in life and recently that maybe that's why my work is the way it is, the way it has the gravityless field. And it seems like it's, oh, is it on stage or is she just tumbling in the sheets of her bedroom? Because I was, I don't sleep very well, so I've been like a gang skater. So a lot of my work has this circular form, this floating, on a stainless floating form. But I don't know. I uh, I think how my process of like tying a story to certain things is tying a story to symbolism of objects. So a recent series I finished as the pandemic was kind of like a, going in full swing. Um, was the series called Cosmic Connections where these floating people that are like friends or volunteers that would pose for me in these large scale installations with these giant uh, dyed fabrics that I would hang up. You know, we look and I was trying to mimic clouds and that's my reference to moving around. It's like I'm out in space. I don't know where I'm, what planet I should land on, what with my home, you know, but not in a bad way, just more of a find my own place in the world. So I think when I would create these big drawings, I was trying to relate to that feeling of, okay, I'm out in space, I'm gravityless, I'm like in this sleepless dream where, you know, certain objects might feel a connection to you more so than a certain place. So I was translating feeling of home through certain objects that were personal to me that I would carry between my parents' home and as I would move around so frequently between places. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, that how... You know, it's this element of what is personal, right? For some people, personal has to remain deeply within, right? And, and sometimes the work they make is there is so much distance between what is personal and what the artwork they are making is... It's interesting because that distance is also experienced by the viewer because many times I look at a work and I just think I just can't get into it because why and I sometimes feel like maybe the artist has has sort of 
not put, I mean, has sort of made himself or herself so distant from that work. And here we both are talking about personal experiences and personal journeys and how you brought your personal into the work and how I bring my personal meanderings into my work. So um, I'm just thinking, um, once you have got this personal sort of into the artwork, how important is it for you to now let it go like a child? Like I have my child, I made it all by myself and I'm, and then suddenly you have to let it go to sort of allow other people to get into it and to sort of uh, get that message, whatever the artwork is it trying to give and how it sort of makes that viewer a different person after viewing that work. I think one time I had the public interact with the work rather than because when I when I, I used to be able to come up with characters in my head when I was a lot younger for the stories, you know, making the comic strips. I can imagine people and what, how they sort of look like. Well, going through trainings you call through school, I had to look, I had to find figures by drawing them from observation. I would have to have a picture of someone or somebody posed for me in order for me to draw them. And so instead of saying, hey, I need you to pose like this, I created a temporary space for them to move through. And then I would just take photos of how they would move through. I would give them a, okay, here, you have five minutes, just move through the fabric like you're going through the, the trees in the woods or imagine that you're like trying to find the pillow amongst the sheets of your bed, you know, I would give them a random sentence or a topic to think about as they're moving through and they would come up with these gorgeous forms of, oh, I'm just like kind of swirling around the, this fabric or I'm like twisting myself in it or carrying. So sometimes I'll put a bucket of rocks as well for them to hold like little asteroids and asteroid belt, you know, I would try to pull similar elements that I think would match to the cosmic realm of Oh, what is space clouds look like? Well, they kind of look like organic clouds, but with a lot more color. And, and then the rocks are kind of like symbolism for stars, but you can't touch stars too far away. So I would have them, they ended up being these beautiful photographs of people moving through space that I would use within the drawing. So that's, I think those are moments of when I would let the piece go is, is when I would have them close to me, but I wouldn't require them to be like, Make sure your head is this way. Make sure your hand is just slightly. So um, I didn't care what kind of form they would allow their body to move through. I just wanted to see them in movement because then I would capture a genuine structure within the space. So, uh, so just this question just came to my mind is how important is the viewer to you? Or is the viewer important? Even if, even if, I mean, is there a viewer at all? Uh, do you make the work and do you make it for yourself? Or, uh, or you just forget that there is a viewer and viewer is someone who's just passing by? It depends because we're in a very modern time where we can instantly share something to thousands of people with the right hashtags, right? We can say, look at the food I ate at dinner today. Let me brag about what I have. And then people are like, oh, I wish I had that for food. Or I wish I could travel there and they like it. You know, the envious structure is what is ingrained in our vanity. And it, it's, it's, it's beautiful and it's almost kind of harmful to be like, well, instead of let me make drawings or painting or on-site installations for just a moment and then just walk away from it, you know, and just leave it alone. Only time I can think of is when when I work with uh, the children, you know, I, I taught a homeschool class at one time, and sometimes I'll like interact at a summer camp where I'll watch the kids and I'll be like, oh, let me draw a little doodle. And they're like, can you draw me this? And I'll do a 10 minute sketch of them and I'll just give them, I won't even take a picture because it's not for me, it's for them. You know, and that's like the selfish act of, oh, here you go. You know, you just find a picture yourself and they're just like in awe of it. Or when I would do, permanent marker graffiti like downtown when I would go walk around at night I would leave like a little just a little scribble of a little quote that came to my head a little scripts of prose and 
and I would just leave it. But sometimes I'll sign it with a different name, and I'm like, oh, I'm this person, but I'm, I wasn't. So I think when it's little notes of memory that I don't collect in my own personal or virtual diary, those are moments where I, that's when I'm leaving the piece alone. If it's a big work, like a mural or a canvas, um, sometimes I'm the type that other artists, I'm like the other artists where we share it instantly. Sometimes maybe family members want to know what we're making or your colleagues from school or work or like, what you doing? You know, are you making something? It's almost like you have to one up the next person you uh, respect half the time. But sometimes I'm, I'm creating something to leave behind, I think. Maybe that's my catalog. I am trying to have my own per my own uh, memory of it for when I grow older and kids uh, I can show my kids on whatever device they have in the future. Like, all right, this is what you're creating me. You know, or there's something I can actually show it because these materials are temporary anyways. You know, house paint lasts, what, 10 years before it cracks? Oil paint now, maybe, eh, depending on what, what they put in the pigment. So things don't last forever. And technology is one of those things that can kind of make things last just a little bit longer than its original form. So. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be nice if anybody wants to ask questions, you know, don't don't be worried about interrupting us. Just 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 type your questions and we are sort of happy to go with the flow, like I said, to start with. So, and, I was, uh, and I was thinking we could like like while they're asking questions or if you wanna show our PDF, if you want to go first, if you want to show your your work. Okay. And okay. do a quick little um, tidbit. So people can have like a visual. Okay, so if I click on share screen, oh, okay, I think Sarah has to help with sharing the screen because I have my PDF, which is open. So if you uh, have your images open, the screen open that you want to show your images on, and then you just need to click literally in the middle of that um, green share screen button. Share screen. I've done the share screen and I have desktop, uh, share. If I do desktop, I've not uh, open system preferences. It's, uh, so it should be the at the bottom of your screen, Rekha, if you take your um, mouse right to the bottom. Then you get like a little yeah. pop-up bar with all the symbols and it should be next to the chat. Yeah, so if I click on that, somehow it's not working. The preview, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, somebody else is showing off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so you just need to click in the, in the middle of that um, green button. And then it'll bring up lots of different options. And you just have to click on the one that you want to share. Yeah. So basically I have now a desktop, which has a triangle and exclamation mark on it. So how do I, and there's whiteboard, iPhone, universal so access preview finder. You need to have your PDF open. Yeah. I have my PDF open. Oh. Then my tech support um, is at an end. I um, if your PDF Dropbox, is open, Google then Drive. you should be able to to share from that. Do you have any yeah. ideas? Um, um, it's can okay. You quickly, can you quickly um, email your PDF to someone and then they can share screen for you? Okay. Yeah, let me just do that. I will send my PDF to you, Sarah. Is that okay? Sure. If you send uh, it to the Lacuna Festivals. Um, email. Shall I send it on WhatsApp? Is that okay? Um, if I you send it on email, on the comments, because then I, I want to okay. on the okay. Um, so I'll just send it to info or you can send Lacuna. it in the chat, like um, Channing's just done. That that works too. And then people oh, can look okay. through if they like. Oh, yeah. perfect! Uh, your computer, that's perfect. And uh, Lacuna Distance, and I've got my PDF right here. Okay, I've just sent it on that. Um, so we have, we have a, a question in the chat. No, question, in London, which perhaps you're saying, you can um, answer whilst you're whilst you're waiting okay. for these to come through. 
Okay, so Nilanjan is asking, do you ever actively look for a narrative for the works that you make or do the stories find you organically? Uh, Channing, do you want to answer that question first? No, you, you go first. <laughs> I'm so coming up my head. <laughs> I just think that there are stories happening around me all the time. Uh, and I feel like every person has a story to tell and all that person needs is, is, a, is a listener, you know. And I, I remember when I was in university, um, I did this whole project on standing outside Central St. Martins, which is in the midst of Soho, and just asking people, hi, uh, my name is Rekha. Um, would you like to take part in a project? Uh, and... And I will take them into my basement where I had cameras set up and everything. And they would tell me, you know, many people would actually say, no, I'm sorry, I, 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 I need a drink and run off. But there were some brave people who will come and then who actually gave me, told me a whole lot of stories. And I remember even in the train or while walking in the underpass, uh, there was this homeless guy sitting there. Uh, every day I'll pass him and he'll say hello. And, and one day he said, come sit next to me. I need to talk to you. <laughs> and he put a Metro newspaper for my ass to park on. <laughs> and, uh. I, and he told me his whole story. And then he said, tell me a problem uh, uh, which you have and I will solve it for you. And I had to, I told him I had, a, I have a dissertation. I cannot do this academic shit anymore i cannot uh you know google synonyms for uh you know uh, to look for academic terms to insert in my dissertation i don't know where to start and he gave me one of the best uh advice ever he said right what whatever comes into your head start writing it don't question your initial sort of don't start uh don't be harsh on yourself just 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 put everything down. So, uh, so to answer your question, Nilanjan, the stories are all around you. All as an artist you have to do is to be able to listen. And once you have the stories in front of you, then you have to discern as to which story appeals to you the most, which is the one which kind of connects to you within your heart. And then weave that story into, into that tapestry which 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 is all yours to to make and to sort of re uh, sort of what do you call it uh, reimagine those stories in a different context what about you eric uh, channing what do you think do the stories do are the stories within you or do they come to you or it's it's half and half uh Sometimes I go in starting a project thinking, okay, I want to put this form for this subject, for these materials, you know, and maybe I want to tell this kind of story. But as I'm working on a project, the story changes, you know, the, the, the words, the prose come to me in a different way where the, um, for example, the spyglass, I'll come up with a script of, well, I guide myself through these unknown realms, right? You know, that's what compass is for. So maybe I'll scribble that with, my the charts and the drawings that I you know, you know, sketch on a wall and it, it it changes sometimes as I go in, but then it comes the original intent become more the original intention for the work comes back at the end when it's complete or when I finally show the completed work to someone to if they want to critique it or just say, hey, look, this is what I recently did if you, if you want to see what I've done. And sometimes the stories are or like little sentences or little incomplete sentences, you know, the story, you know, cycle life is always changing. You know, it's reincarnation of thinking, oh, I want to become this, or I want this child to become a doctor. And then they end up becoming an athlete instead. And then at the end, they realize, oh, maybe I was healing myself or healing other people to feel inspired to you know, do what they want to rather than what they were expected to be. So I think with that, with my work, it's like a, giving birth to a child, like I've never had children, I don't know the experience of it. I, I don't think I'd be a good parent anyway, <laughs> but 
but I think the idea of me creating something and saying, okay, this is the child that I've completed. I hope it turns into this. And then as possibly the years go by, the intent of the message of the work or the story of the work will change. I mean, we see it through history. Maybe those well-known artists that we know in our history books, they were just painting the fields because that's all that they were around. You know, they didn't, were thinking of, oh, this was during this time period and they were thinking about this and this. I'm like, I don't know. I think they were just painting what they were seeing or what they were feeling. Experiencing. <laughs> exactly. They were in their stories. They weren't thinking too deeply about the, the content behind the work. Maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. or nowadays we're almost having to come up with a script before we start and keeping that script while making and then hoping at the end when you show off the work and part of your art statement you're you're explaining more than what the piece could say without any words you know and yeah. I, mean, I miss the idea of like I'm satisfied with the work and how it looks and the pieces of the puzzle I put together and nowadays it's almost like you can be really great at what you do in the skill or the skills that you have but sometimes you'll see some work and it's like, oh, it's this really in-depth content. And then you look at the piece and you're like, oh, I didn't expect <laughs> that story to be that, you know, because it, maybe it's a lot simpler than what they're explaining. So yeah. it's, but. But it's, the thing uh, is, uh, what you're saying is to go back to what you said about having a baby, you've never had a child. I'll tell you, physically, it's easy to have a child and to give birth to it. But every time you have an artwork to, conceive and to uh, and to consider the material which has to carry that idea and to be able to give birth to an artwork it's tough <laughs> and I have had two children and therefore I can tell you it's tough to give birth to an artwork uh, than to an actual child so uh, <laughs> So uh, Sarah says she has images to share but before that Erica has asked a question is there an artwork you have in mind to do income for future when you're ready for it? Something you want to do, but feel you're not yet ready for? I think uh, I work in a sections and then I put it all together. So I would do a series of these lyrical, abstracted, um, geometric Art Nouveau kind of like pillars and colorful gradient structures in a very symmetrical balance, very sci-fi, 80s <laughs> rocker film kind of looking images. And then I would have a separate work with just stars, like orbs with like parts. And, you know, I would keep these. And then I would have like figures kind of like an empty box. So I would have pieces of work separated. And then I would bring them all together and create a series with all the pieces put together. And then after I completed the series, I would take it apart and I think I'm in a take it apart moment right now. And I'm thinking the next time I bring all the pieces back together after I've studied each section or I've studied each form and I'm satisfied with how I've you know, evolved it, I would bring it back together. I think my next move would be creating an all-in-one work where it's not just a piece on a wall. Now I want it to be something where people go into an experience. So last, altogether series I did. There was like a book to start the bedtime story. Then there was the paintings on the wall. And these are like paintings they take up like a 20 foot, 30 foot long wall. And that would be the dream scenes that you would see walking through the work. And then at the very end, you see the this installation of floating objects from the dreams from the original storybook. So that was the most recent put together work I've done. And I want to do something like that again. I don't know if I'm I might be ready, but I'm not yet because I need to get all the materials, I think, or have a, a show to maybe present it at or a space, not just a specific show, but a space to, to you know, I see just, it all together. Uh, yeah. So um, I just feel like, you know, when it comes to someone like I've been told twice, can you do something I love? You know, they've seen a work of mine, which is included in that PDF. You'll see it. And they say, you know, there is a certain section of your work, which I really love and I want to buy it. And there's, it's all about sunflowers. Can you do it? So I grabbed a canvas and took a lot of trouble to draw at least 50 sunflowers on it. And then I happened to see a photograph of mine where 
a field of sunflowers and had the sky, which is full of a mix of colors of violet and what's that color? Um, brilliant violet and blues. So guess what? I started painting the violet and the blues and everything on the top. And then slowly and steadily kept, kept painting over the sunflowers, which I'd taken almost a week to draw on commission and just, just zoom, 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 gone. So for me, I don't think, I think work sort of, I need a blank canvas and I need to sit at the canvas for some time and I just do it. And once I start doing it, I, I'm there in it. Like, like once you have, once you get pregnant, you, the child is within you for that nine months, whether you like it or not. You have to, may help it exit. So I'm like that when it comes to doing work and I only do it when I'm ready. Otherwise, um, otherwise, no, <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> so um, as far as the Lacuna Festival, um, I have created some works um, which I sort of started with last year during Christmas and stuff like that. And somehow it seemed to fit into the whole theme of distance. So if we share the images, maybe we could have a discussion about that. Uh, so hopefully you should be able to see the images now. Yeah. Ah, good. Just tell Perfect. me when you want me to um, scroll, scroll down. down. Okay, so these are my works. Uh, this is what I, this is what I've I had submitted to the Lacuna Festival and got accepted. So if we just scroll down the first two pages, then you know it shows the bubbles, stroke bubbles. So um, this somehow the idea came to me about you know how we all are in this kind of bubble. So there, uh, if you can just pause a bit, uh, over there is a bubble with a small child and a baby within it. So there are births uh, which are happening by themselves. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, please. Uh, so you can sort of, I think, is that it with the bubbles or? Oh yeah, that's it, You are, if you can. So I have created these individual bubbles, which are bubbles and within which people exist. I sort of, uh, I'm very rough and rust, rustic in my approach to work uh, because I feel like I'm a child sometimes, you know, when I have these materials and I'm busy doing things, I just don't want to. So if you scroll up a little bit, uh, please. Uh, so these are the works I created where if you see there are, uh, there is a coffin there uh, with, uh, with a body within. So there are, so I've sort of tried to visually depict um, uh, how people's lives are in, during this pandemic, you know. We're all sitting hunched over doing things. That's a guy in a toilet potty with his book. I mean, everything sort of, and it's kind of seemed very appropriate uh, for these times. Uh, there is distance, but sometimes you can be physically very close to each other, but there is a mental distance. And somehow right now, we all seem to be encased in this mental sort of, sort of this distance, which is defined by the transparent ball. So, I'm just thinking, uh, Sarah and Simon, um, what made you, what did you think when you saw this, the images of these works? Um, so when I saw these works, I saw these kind of in the middle of a range of other submissions and um, it was becoming very quickly, um, very apparent, very quickly that the pandemic was having such a huge impact on the artwork that um, we were all making. Um, mm -hmm. And not only was it having such a big impact, but it was there were a lot of similar narratives and a lot of similar imagery coming out from lots of different artists from all around the world. So mm -hmm. it was kind of this global experience and it makes it really powerful. 
Um, and in the enforced gallery is, is what we called um, this kind of particular narrative. You'll see works by um, Elgard Wirtel where there's like a little a glass terrarium and little figures seated inside it. There are paintings of people in cages. So this kind of sense of being contained and kind of alone in some way um, is kind of quite a quite a powerful theme this year. Mobile phones in jars. Do you remember that? Yeah. I can't think of the artist's name. Mobile phones in jars all next to each other. So we're all kind of in it together, but we're kind of not together, you know? And so for me, this is it was it was kind of sparking these kind of stories, I guess, I guess in my head. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I I completely agree. Um the narratives that, that came through this your work record kind of reflects the, the narrative that that we saw a lot through people's works. As Sarah said, you know, everyone's everyone's kind of in it together, but but very isolated and very distant. And that that kind of reflects not only through through the pandemic, but I think that that's become quite a norm significant state of being in the in the, the world that we're in at the moment you know everyone's kind of everyone's kind of engrossed in their in their ipads and their phones and they're very focused on on what they're doing and not what's around them yeah I feel like sometimes it's had uh, two different types, two different strands to this, you know, the pandemic is one strand is where, you know, sometimes I find myself, there is a sensory overload around me and all I want is to put my headphones on and be left alone. So there are those people who've been really happy with this kind of bubble and you just, it's like a child, you know, if you see a child leave, watch a child for some time, they'll go to a corner, put a sheet on the top and make a den for themselves. And they are very happy there. But there are some people who are mentally so isolated and insulated that they need that chatter from outside to have a sense of belonging to the community, to to the rest of the world, you know, otherwise it becomes overwhelmingly empty and dark within themselves. So it's interesting, you know, how people have coped with these times and how, how are we going to be slowly introducing ourselves back into the, maybe not so, not, not like the previous, but a different world. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Like we're we're virtually together, <laughs> physically yeah, apart. And, I know, uh, but we so, were we were already that before COVID. That's the funny thing. But now it's not just with people around the world. It's people we know, family, friends, and the unknown. It's fear the hearing the unknown. Um, like not not trying out things and not not trying to go past that it's now it's like almost this it's like you feel like you need to have a bubble to feel safe and secure it's like, isn't that what the phones were you feel safe and secure that and immediately you can call someone rather than i they go to my home phone pick up a line and hopefully I, I you know click with them but now with the phone it's immediate yeah. access to things but is it immediate affection is it immediate need for what we really want you know it's mm. it's like a I don't want to. I don't want to say a quick pleasure, right? It, it gets the stress out. You're you're satisfied with what what came, and now you're kind of like, all right. I guess we'll go get dinner or something. You know, it's unless you have that emotional connection with someone, is it really is it really worth the time? You know, to to make to draw that bridge of oh, we we're able to find some kind of likeness to each other or we found this connection because we both like similar things rather than all oh, is just quick let's quickly find like a picture because it's someplace I want to go but I'm not actually going to go there 
you know, because it's mm. not safe. What, what ifs, you know, we're always in this constant of what ifs and. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, you see that that's for someone at my age and where I am now at my stage of career, that constant chatter actually stops me from listening to my own inner thoughts. It stops me from really understanding who I, who am I really? And maybe that's why I like site specific stuff up. That's why when I go to this small village in Lithuania, nobody knows me there. And I don't have all my usual chatter over there. And therefore, when I experience or encounter a situation, a physical situation, then you're starting from a blank canvas. So then I kind of listen to my thoughts, my instincts, and I reacquaint myself with what, what, you know, I'm a summation of all my thoughts, my experiences, my feelings. And in this modern world where, like you said, there is a constant sort of overload of everybody doing everything they want. I'm in this culture festival, I'm doing this. You sometimes cannot differentiate between your own thoughts and the other person's thought. You don't know like, am I really saying what I want to say? Or is it like a child saying that, you know, uh, repeating what the it hears? So for me, this situation, has given me the chance to insulate myself a bit, to give myself time to understand myself better. Um, and that's why I think these, this set of works, I can relate to it, you know? I mean, it, it, I use children's furniture <laughs> and I bought these bubbles and I squished them all in and, you know, sort of the whole making of it and then taking the photographs of it. I mean, I think either which way, whether you're actually physically encountering this work or whether you see it online on a digital format, uh, I, I must say that I still can relate to it um, as a viewer. So uh, I, I don't know, Channing, shall we see your works? Because we've already sort of gone into our sort of <laughs> whatever time limit we gave and we might lose all our uh, viewers and yeah. only Sarah and then Sarah yeah. and Simon uh, you know I don't know what their plans are later but let's I see yours don't worry about us can you see this or do I need to unshare yes. and reshare no we can see it thank you okay great again just let me know when to scroll Channing okay so the first three photos that you see as she goes through will be these were works that I did, finished up my thesis at, a, at Florida State University, where I wanted to create multiple layers of like, uh, inspired by constellation charts, inspired by the figures that move through those fabric installations I created and also have objects symbolize certain stories or certain scripts. So I put the script that I wanted to match with the object that is in each piece. So if you want to scroll down a little bit, um, there was a moment where people were like, oh, why did you have one character with white hair, one character with black hair? And I wanted to show this duality of, like, a lot of dreams I have, sometimes there isn't a lot of color, so color is very muted when I sleep. So sometimes I'll notice, like, oh, someone has white hair. So sometimes the white hair person is not me. The person with dark hair symbolizes me when I would be dreaming. So I would know, okay, I am portraying this person or some of my dreams I would portray as the third person watching over a memory that already happened. And I remember in my dreams, I think, oh, it's currently happening, but when you wake up, it's like, oh, that's a memory from a long time ago, or it's multiple stories happening at once, once when I sleep. So these figures, the way they're posed, are actually multiple pictures put together of people that pose for me within this installation. So they're not actually, some of these people didn't actually pose with each other it was just two pictures i put together from the installation shots that i took and i wanted to tell like a, like those stained glass window uh painting windows that you see in churches or even large paintings or murals of stories of like these floating angels or these 
pe these individuals going on odysseys and adventures, you know, women chopping off the guy's head to end a war. And I wanted to show a story of, oh, these people are maybe sleeping or they're awake and they're interacting with these objects. Like, for example, this spyglass, I, as I said earlier, my dad and I, we looked through a telescope when I was growing up to see the stars and I would always have to find which star pattern was in the sky. And then the pecans that you see floating out of the bag, they were growing up, there was always a pecan tree near one of the houses I lived in. There was one in South Carolina at one point. And then later on when I moved, when I was finishing up my studies, there was a pecan tree near the apartment that I lived. So it's just kind of like, oh, I remember growing up, there was these type of plant or seed near where I live. And it just, it, as I talk about a cycle, of things with symbols coming back in and out of my life. You know, I'd remember moments of when I was a little kid, I would collect little rocks and that's why I see these floating rocks within the insulation because I always thought they were like little bits of the landscape. And my dad eventually, like a few years ago, he, he said, I have a rock collection too. So when he was growing up my age, raising a family, he showed me his collection of box of rocks. And I'm like, I didn't even know he collected rocks as well. So it's that connection. <laughs> I mean, what he <laughs> did when he was my age currently and then I did as a little kid to something like was it genetic I was collecting random pieces of rocks that other people would just kick and be like oh this rock I stepped on but for I don't guess for us or for my father and I and probably other people at that experience where they've like oh this rock is from that one place I went to rather than collecting a piece or souvenir from New York that says I love New York something about taking the piece of earth with you you know it, for me, a deeper meaning, you know, rather than an object that could, you know, deteriorate after a few years with a couple of holes or just burn in the laundry. And something with rocks, I feel like they, they last a long time. They become, they break into the little pieces and they can reform again over time. They're just like almost recycling themselves if you want to go down to the next couple images. So with these dream, circular dreams, I wanted to put a reference to I dream about people I've met or friends I've lived with or family members. I wanted to put the objects that I'm connected to, such as I always have like a, a, a length of rope with me because sometimes if I need to move around again, I can use the rope to tie multiple things together or the tools of use, the little objects like I always have a pencil, a ruler, drafts for us, and a little fillers roller where if I need to like create an ingrain in the books that I make because I'm I mostly make uh, books. When I create these large-scale paintings, I do those once in a while, but I'm always binding books together because I'm always trying to find a story. I'm always drawing stories, illustrating something. And I wanted to cre create the illustrations that I make in these small-scale stories that I've done throughout my life. I wanted to emulate them into a large-scale mural that met with my the uh, graphic novel aesthetic with the mapping poetic narrative that I was trying to match with, either finding my own place by using maps or find my way with the, the words that I use within the words. So it's within the paint, these paintings, I was doing these multiple layers of, okay, I didn't want it to be just a complete painting. I wanted to show the raw drawing charcoal and the charcoal drawing underneath. I wanted to show the process of how I got from point A to point B, such as how you see on the um, GPS maps when you're trying to find a location. I'm, I'm the type, I like to, I'm opposite of Rick, where I'm, I'm like, I need to make sure where I'm going, I know which is the main street. So if <laughs> somebody won't take me, I know how to get back to the hotel or wherever. I, I like to know where I'm going. Cause I've always had this uncertainty a little bit growing up, a little bit growing up where I'm like, okay, I know where I'm gonna be this week or that week. And I always had to take multiple buses home from the school and, it was just kind of like I always had to know what time to be at some place. I've always had this schedule in my mind of like if I'm late, um, you know, I'm doomed, you know, but nowadays everything's kind of like chill and whatnot. So I would, you know, it's, oh, it's interesting yeah. that uh, you, you say that because I think once I went to Barcelona and my the hotel I was supposed to stay, some problem, there was a problem. So I just sort of went to a youth hostel. The guy said, oh yeah, you have your own room. And ultimately I went into the room. I was sharing it. There were four bunk beds. Mm -hmm. And then I went for a shower and came back and there were seven guys in the room. <laughs> and I had, 
I had, you know, sort of absolutely no idea. But the kind of experience that came out of that was something I'll remember all my life. So Channing, you should come with me. Trust me, we'll get lost, but I'll hold your hand throughout. <laughs> and we'll take care of, I'll take care of you. I mean, but there is. I mean, I, I did go out of my bubble. So the work that I actually used for this, I, I think that I used to get into the festival was rando nodding drawings. So I, I've never done rando nodding before. And became a fad during pandemic. People were like, "We can't go anywhere public, but we can go into the woods." So, if you want to go down to the last couple of images, I did these GPS-inspired drawings of places where I would pick a locate. I would do the random nodding button, and it would send me to a location. So, I'd I would take a screenshot of where it was. I would go to that location. I would find maybe bits of rocks or bits of seeds and. I would kind of walk around the area and I would take, of course, regular photos of a look, look at the woods or a look, there's a random building nearby. And sometimes the random nodding thing, it was kind of scary. I'm like, this is like, kind of like some guy's going to come out with a hatchet and <laughs> come get me. But it was, it was kind of like a good experience to not plan it. It was more of like, it was a good, it was a good random way to experience a place you haven't been to. And it's actually, it's like locating it's located in a certain area, so I'd take back with me to the to my studio. Have these little bits of seeds, these little plants, sometimes leaves, and then I would mark on a paper. Like when I would walk around, I would mark little spots where I would stand for five seconds to just take in the view. And that's what you see in the bottom left corner of the drawing is the spots that I would stop at on the actual um, the encased drawing where it, this is the aerial view or an aerial landscape of the DPS image that I took. And then I would, I don't know, <laughs> I like remember all the layers that I had with this, uh, I don't know, it's like, we see like these giant acorns came from this little pond that's called the Fairway Pond, which is like a couple of neighborhoods um, down from where I live. I've never been to that area because I have no reason being in a neighborhood, but I try to respect the people's uh, properties. I didn't go between houses, I would make sure I'm like at an area where it's like, okay, there's a sidewalk and I'm just walking around and whatnot, but I would mark where I've been. And then when I come back to the studio, I would do a drawing based off of that GPS aerial view. And I don't know, I wanted to, I was trying to get out of the bubble and I put the, I put the landscape in back in the bubble, but the, the, the 40 page series that I did was my way of saying, okay, I couldn't really go out and do things. I couldn't really go see family. I couldn't went to work maybe half the time, but I was able to go and do something where I'm not trapped in the house. I wasn't, I wouldn't feel like I'm seeing the same four walls of the, of the space or my room of my studio or where I was living at that time. I wasn't just in one place. I was trying to see other places I wasn't familiar with so I can Get my brain refreshed like yes this is a stressful time you know we, we, the uncertainty is like well you know what let your location be uncertain too but then pull inspiration from where you were and, you know make something out of out of a bad make something out of a terrible situation or make something out of a stressful situation rather than wallowing it in the misery or wallowing in feeling like i can't do anything because i'm not you you know i haven't had anybody to really draw or have my usual way of working changed but in a good way where I was able to do something I'm not comfortable with like I don't do any landscape like I don't do places I'm more familiar with an object and then people I, that's my forte that's my preference but doing this exercise you know random nodding and drawing landscape they're not really good at drawing like actual like a one per, one point perspective or two point perspective landscape I changed it to be an aerial view so I can get a sense of okay I can't draw a place normally but I was able to get an essence of it, you know, and it's just ambiguous enough where somebody could be like, that looks like that one area I used to go to. And mm. yeah, that was, yeah. It looks, it feels like, you know, all these circular sort of discs, which have like a micro world within them. It almost feels like you're still kind of looking through the telescope with your dad there, you know, it's almost everything is kind of 
about that time and it's also about that sort of what do you call it you know the first time i looked through a telescope at the moon so close i mean i can never forget it it's like the craters it's like such a shadows the, <laughs> yeah so it almost feels like you are looking through the telescope every time every time i see these circular works of yours like what would it look like for an astronaut or aliens or the the stars like you know we're always looking at the stars trying to find answers out there and like I, lo I love the idea of going to space travel and seeing the world beyond our own It'd be a new adventure you know but I wonder are they thinking the same thing looking at us looking at this planet of life they're looking like oh what is that right there what is that area why would they build in this way why would they build these communities of houses for years and years we've eons you know we've always built next to each other even though we're in separate boxes separate rooms separate towns we're always building towards each other we're built we're i don't know we're coming together architecturally without even realizing it and i think the idea of like i was like from gps we can see oh from satellite i can see down earth it's like well is that what it looks like to the heavens to those constellations do we just look like do we look like as inspirational as we as we think we are when we look at the stars or are we just okay that looks like a bunch of dirt and water mixed together and uh, I don't know, like creating these little worlds you know like i feel like with a lot of my drawings i'm trying to create this world this internal thing either within my creating a visual form within my mind or trying to relate multiple memories into one mm -hmm. one piece or one layer and yeah, little micro worlds. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really really interesting. And did your did did you as a child? Uh, it, it was, I mean, must have been quite traumatic for you to feel, you know, to be involved in this break between your parents, and therefore you were sort of physically divided between the two. And I feel like that's, that's all, you know, in, uh, in within this multiple layers of you as an artist. And it's all sort of such a significant, important part of the work still. I mean, it might have happened when you were a very young child, but as an older person now, do you want to see that? I think I see it now. Before I was just trying to, when I was always creating this visual world, like always wanting to be somewhere else because I didn't understand why they were going through what they were going through because they, you know, they kept it between themselves and I, they didn't bring me into the drama of it. But I was part of it. I was, you know, you know, they were, they made a deal to, you know, share, share. My brother and I, and we we didn't understand until we became adults, and we realized like they were their own individuals, and sometimes things don't work out. But they did the best they can with what they had, and I thought of that as growing up, like, well, they don't have a lot of money. What can I do with this practice, you know, without going into debt? And I wanted, and I found inspiration in the situations I've been through, and living between or moving around, going to college, and finding a way to make things work, and being able to tell my experience without sounding like, oh, what was me? I went through this, so pity me, and look how I've struggled. And let me show you through my art that I'm struggling. He's like, no, I'm not going to show a struggle through my art. I'm not going to show that, I, that it was a bad thing that just sometimes things aren't pitch perfect nuclear American family, right? It's it's a it's a complex thing that we have li living through our various situations, living through sometimes our parents living through us sometimes. And I find myself wanting to try to create a story from the experience that I had through my work in a way where people can look at it and be like, oh, that kind of reminds me of this from back in the day, or maybe somebody will get a memory of it too. And but as I will go on, maybe the work will be translated to something completely different than what I yeah. I'm okay with that because I'll be long gone. I ain't yeah. gonna worry about that anymore. It, it'll be 
it'll be but the thing is uh, i feel like um you know there are there is a spectrum of artists who create a certain type of work you know when i went and saw tracy emin and her sort of bed and with the knife and the two lemons and and there's this whole sort of and then i saw another artist um, uh, mendieta she uses all the menstrual the sort of you know the blood and being very female and so to be frank with you i know that uh, different different uh, types of art have to exist within this world they all speak a different language and um, but i know for sure that i'm not that kind of an artist you know i want to be an artist where i don't my art should not necessarily be about uh, me uh, about me rekha to a female three a mother uh, four an indian uh, brown person i don't want my art to be i i want my art to be at its core none of that and that core sort of intentionality or sentiment it doesn't matter who you are where you are like i created a work for the uh, the rio biennale and that that was a sculpture of casts of feet taken on the site which was the beach and there were footprints left by vendors who were all black and there's a lot of anti black politics so i could have taken it in many which ways you know in brazil i met this guy he said oh i've also done works about these uh, vendors on the beach so i said okay what kind of work he said i took photographs of all of them carrying their heavy stuff and i i put, i put it up on the gallery wall he asked me what did you do i said i took casts of that foot of their feet which was on the sand i made it out of plaster then i washed the plaster and i put it in a circle on a black disc so he said but then where is the connection i mean why would it be about these people so i try to tell him that that is my source my source doesn't have to be revealed in my work i don't have to say that this work is about them but if you encounter my work you would think that that feet could be mine i'm going through that journey you know from birth to death we are stuck in that circle so that kind of core sentimentality of you know transferring that message is the most absolutely most important thing in my art practice i want to shed all the sort of definite kind of what do you call it uh, tracing back to the identity of where that idea came from it has to be an we are all human beings you know it doesn't matter what color my hair is i mean i like simon's hair of course but but the thing is i i think my work is about what is it which makes us human what is it which is about this whole existentiality crisis many times we have each one's crisis is different but we need to have that empathy that sort of you know so when you see my work it that is the most important part of my work in those tiny bubbles i want people i know i've deliberately made it all rough human figure they don't have boobs or they don't have penises and stuff to kind of indicate gender and stuff to be lonely is human so you get what i mean um yeah and so like who do you who do you live with the most throughout your life usually it's not spouse it's yourself you know and can you live with your can you live with yourself you know some some people are just so used to being with other people they they, they enjoy the company of others and it could be like that's just how they are personally but sometimes it could be they are just only they don't know how to yeah you know, they don't it's know interesting how to because that. yeah it in i was in the us and i decided suddenly i'll i'll just book a ticket and go to mexico and my brother's friends and everybody's like but but who are you going with i said nobody it's just me won't you be bored that was their question and i said why would i be bored i mean i'm with the best person i can be with that's me 
I don't need a constant kind of echo next to me. I don't need all that. And if I always, and I realized in Barcelona, right? I was with a group of art students. Everybody looked at us as a group, but the minute I was by myself, people will approach me and I can approach them. People will talk to me and I can talk to them. So you have a different identity as an individual than as a group or as a couple. And I think what you receive from the world is very different. Uh, I mean, feel free to disagree or, but uh, what do the others think, those who are in this chat? What do you think of that kind of situation? Paul, Erica? Or... <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, enjoyed the pictures and very much also the explanations behind them. And we can definitely see you're very different types of artists. Uh, but we're, we're not going to get involved in psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we will assign you the label of viewers and you remain viewers for us. That's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, there's something, um, there's definitely something in being viewed differently as an individual, but also I think that I can't just see it as being human because of my personal experience and also because of experience that people who are very close to me that I've worked with have had. So let me just kind of put that into context. So when I was younger, I was extremely obese. And um, all the way through university, I was extremely obese. And then stuff happened. All of a sudden, I wasn't. I also dyed my mousy brown hair blonde. And I looked like a little gym bunny. And um, I was definitely not treated the same in those two human forms so and that's something that I can change whereas some of the friends that I'm thinking of from the West Indian community in Leeds um, have a really tough time because of the color of their skin and it is undeniable it is undeniable that their experience of living in Leeds and the opportunities that they have and the things that they have to deal with are totally different you know um, just like genders kind of have different things to deal with. Simon's nodding and said one of the first conversations we had about differences in genders were we were talking about how it can be scary to walk through a city centre at night. And then um, Simon was explaining that, you know, it's scary for a bloke too. And I was like, yeah, maybe. But every time you get off the train, you don't have your keys like through your fingers in case somebody's going to attack you. You know, you don't have to think whether your hair is in a ponytail because somebody might grab you. Like, and that wasn't me being paranoid. That was living in a rough part of a city in the UK. That is the reality. So it's like, it would be a lovely ideal for me to be able to think that, you know, everybody is human and we all have the same experiences. And there are some things that we do, like we have, everybody experiences loneliness or love or whatever, but the context that you experience that in is, is very, very yeah. different. Yeah, it is a challenge because uh, as an artist, what do you see? I mean, do you see, it's like the Black Lives Matter, yes. But then for me, it, I have to go a bit deeper into that Black Lives Matter to find out what is that thing which which uh, people of a certain color have, have been experiencing and try and articulate that, that particular aspect of it. So uh, I understand the whole sort of superficial um, aspect of looking at a certain, certain uh, human, but then everything and anything for me has to go deeper than what it seems to appear. And I think I owe it to myself to, and thinking deeper is what is it that I share with that person? I mean, I'm brown, she's white, you're black, but then how do I make that close, uh, sort of 
uh, how do I empathize and extract that one thing which I can uh, relate to and then create work from it? So I think that's the challenge of it. And we all struggle with it. We succeed or we fail. But for me, it's worth um, sort of being, you know, what do they say? Due diligence. That's what I do before I work or um, start any work or any art. Um, I think that's part of who I am as an artist. So, um, um, yeah. I think um, I think the, it's quite it's difficult to sort of go so deep, and then I think we need someone to get us out of it. <laughs> someone I to. have them a recommendation, which is to look up the Ether Network, which is the um, oh I can't remember what it stands for Ethics and Aesthetics. Um, Mm, mm, it's a it's a it's an arts um and humanities research council funded oh. network um and it's all about how you can meaningfully engage with difference and kind of encounter the other whatever that might be um and the they have they're having three online seminars one has been I was one of the um, contributors to the digital provocations and one of the things that came out of that seminar was the fact that the kind of cuts that people make in society between people you can cut to separate but you can also cut to bring together and that's kind of what you're saying you know like you and Channing and Rekha and I all look very different you know but we're we're all females we're all artists you know like how you cut depends on what you get out of it um, awesome. And there was there was some really interesting contributions around that which may interest you. They have a really great um, website, so I would recommend that. Well, yeah. The link and post the link. Oh yes, I can post the link. I can. I can oh yeah, that. that'll be great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's that's very well put actually. To cut, to not separate, but not necessarily just divide. Yeah. But to unite as well. I find that really very interesting. Yeah. So we can tell our stories better. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think uh, we have lots more to talk and I have a lot more images, but what I'll do is I will put my other images and the murals I've been working on, I will put it, uh, I'll add a link to my website and maybe people can have a look at it. Yeah, that would be great. Anything that you feel like you've not had the opportunity to share, um, if it's if it's text based, then we can add that into the text of the um, video, which we will try and get uploaded. If it isn't tonight, it'll be tomorrow. We have the previous event from today to upload first. Um, okay. But yeah, it'll be up in the next couple of days. So anything that you want adding to that, just email okay. us and we'll and we'll add it on. And equally. Okay. Our audience, if you have any questions and you're just a bit shy, that's absolutely fine. Um, but you can also email us at lacunafestivals at gmail.com if you would like to um, ask a question to either ourselves or to either of our fantastic artists. Thank you so much, Rekha and Channing, for giving up your time this evening. We really appreciate your thoughts, your energy, your enthusiasm, your ideas your creativity, sharing your work. It's been, it's been fab. It's been great. Thank you so much. And all we need to make this evening great is for England to take it in. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the football team so, this evening. Channing, do you watch the football too? I don't have time for sports. <laughs> <laughs> But I wish y'all, I wish y'all good luck. I wish y'all good luck. We won. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks again. And apologies for, uh, you know, changing the time. But uh, Paul, I'll be asking you questions tomorrow when I meet you about our talk today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank Thanks you so again. much. Bye. That's been really great. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Rekha. Lovely to meet you, Channing, virtually. Same, virtually. Together, Bye. virtually.
forever apart. <laughs> Hopefully not forever. Maybe no, 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 you can come, maybe you can come visit. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Simon. Thanks, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.